big big episode today as we are joined by a man who definitely doesn't need an introduction i mean if you are watching this absolutely obscure little podcast that means you are interested in the game and if you are interested in the game it is impossible that you haven't heard of this gentleman who joins us today from london called gerard kimber so welcome to the podcast gerard big thank you for joining us no problems So well the cricket lockdown is almost over live cricket action not too far from us now how how do you feel about that does that make you happy or does that make you apprehensive i mean you're talking about having international games in a country that is completely not on top of the virus it seems to me like a very silly move uh, on the part of cricket uh, desperation Uh, and it's not just them is it it's basketball it's premier league football it's uh, you know Aussie rules football in australia it doesn't really matter these leagues and sports around the world are desperate to get back in front of us to continue to milk us uh, i just think there are more important things in the world at the moment than perhaps uh, testing uh, joffre archer to see if he you know if he if he's going to infect any other players i think uh, i think there's no clear reason why we're playing this series and it's uh, it seems a bit silly to me for being honest as elvis presley said only fools rush in so we have our answers there but uh, yeah big series irrespective of the context england versus west indies england versus pakistan any predictions what do you think west indies have got a team good enough to challenge the english team at home i mean they've certainly got the bowlers that can they can rattle england um, their bats kind of really been struggling in recent times but the good news is that they used to the duke's ball moving all around and it being tough because that's what happens in the west indies now so uh for them i think that you know that that prepares them uh, pakistan i have no idea it looks like half the half the team is uh got covid and who knows what will happen between and uh, now and then but uh but you know we'll have to have a look at it and see who the team is closer to the time but i would assume that it would be a bit of a scrappy contest england versus the west indies with everything that's going on well with pakistan nobody has any idea at any point of time and that's the best part about pakistan cricket but uh, yeah there there were statements about england having to play in front of empty stadiums that might work in the favor of uh, west indies what do you think about that yeah I, look i mean it helps for the west indies because it will be a neutral um a neutral venue in in some ways at least uh, but i'm not sure it makes a huge difference i mean it can't be more than a couple of percentage points can it so if west indies aren't good enough to get close to begin with i don't think uh, not having crowd will change things all right so gerard moving on to you your career graph is a fascinating one you began with your blog cricket with balls in 2008 then things began moving award winning books happened death of a gentleman happened of course cricket info happened so now as someone who has followed you your work for a very long time now one thing that not just me everyone has noticed is you know something that has remained constant throughout this period is a very peculiar absolutely original style of yours i mean you have broken new grounds with your style be it writing be it presenting so couple of questions on that first is how did you develop it was there a conscious effort to do something different from what was being done and uh, second is you know now that you have become the gerard kimber who has a certain reputation and a body of work is there some kind of pressure to keep producing something that's breaking new grounds that's different in a way i i grew up reading a uh, very straight laced newspaper writers in australia write about cricket i didn't read a lot of gideon haig or ray robinson or some of the other you know incredible australian cricket writers i, did, I the, the books that i had were very were mostly written by people like ken peace and a uh, very good journalist but you know not literary um type writers um and so i wanted to be a film maker so i was writing screen uh, screen plays and uh, you know occasionally dabbling in documentary short documentary projects making music videos those sorts of things and a lot of my friends didn't talk about cricket in any way similar to the way that the newspaper guys would would talk about cricket uh, for one we had a lot more fun when we talked about cricket um and also you know for us cricket came with basketball and football and adam sandler films and pop culture references so i just thought that we had a very good knowledge of cricket at that time because we watched so much of it listened um to so much of it and you know and read most of the, the basic articles i just thought if i just sort of copied that of what me and my friends would do around the you know around a bar late at night or you know uh, in a hostel in chicago when we're supposed to be going to sleep um 
if, if I could capture that vibe, then it, uh, it would be fun to write about. But I wasn't really thinking about changing cricket writing or anything. I just thought that our voices hadn't really been heard. Um, the sort of super fan voices, if you look at, if you look at cricket writing up until 2008, most of the people who write it um, were journalists first um, and fans second. And uh, which, which is great. And there's some brilliant work done by those people. But the other side wasn't being really looked at at all. And I, I suppose now if you look back on it, Rob Smythe was coming through. Um, uh, there were other bloggers coming through um, as well. But it didn't, you didn't really, because it wasn't as global a game. So I basically thought, well, I'm just going to do what my friends do. And I'm going to write it in a bit of a character's voice, which will give me a freedom. You know, it's not Jared Kimber, 28-year-old who no one knows. Uh, it's Uncle J Rod, who's this, you know, weird voice, um, which was which was taken from a novel I was writing at the time, to be honest. Oh, nice! Um, and all these sort of things, and you know, it's a very, very loosely, loosely, loosely semi-autobiographical character, I suppose, in some ways. Uh, but that's where it came from. So I just sort of went with that, um, and then you know, it turns out that there were well, hundreds of thousands of people like me out there, really. I mean, if you look at the, the sorts of things that have happened since I sort of started with Krugel Balls, like Grantland and The Ringer, um, you look at, uh, you know, it, basically the, the super fan writers have taken over um, uh, sports writing around the world, especially in America, um, but people like Jonathan Liu um, in, in the UK, uh, you're seeing them come through in Asia as well. And that was, Asia was a very strict market yep. when it came to writing about sport. Uh, when I first broke in, and it's certainly not now, um, you know, Sid Munger writes a whole article about how Neil Wagner is like a wrestler. Uh, just not sure that those sorts of things would have were, were as easy easy to do um, that that long ago. So suddenly you have this sort of break in the way that everything's going. So I, you know, I I, I remember having a chat with Gideon Hay very early on and, you know, saying how much I respected him. And he said, but you've told me you've never read any of my books. I said, no, but I've read a couple of your articles. And, and then he sort of looked at me, he goes, do you read many cricket books? And I said, no. And I said, if I read a lot of cricket books, do you think I'd write the way that I do? And he sort of looked back and said, no, probably not. So it was an advantage. I was in cricket uh, without having been taught how to write about cricket writing um, because I was never going to write the newspaper article style stuff. I still don't really do that now. So uh, that didn't, that didn't infect me. So it just sort of happened. And as far as the pressure goes, especially to create new things, no, I mean, not, not at all. I just don't think of it that way. Um, most of the new things that other people see is innovations and, um, you know, uh, uh, what, what did um, someone write the other day? Disruptors and all that sort of stuff. That's not how I look at what I do. I basically go, uh, I'm bored of doing this kind of thing now. What should I do next? So if you look at, if you just look at basic writing, um, you know, I started writing a very bloggy um, style of, of thing. I then went into sort of more feature uh, bloggy style. I then went into long form writing. I then went into analytics. Uh, I suppose you could now say I now write podcasts and videos as well. That, that's just boredom. And once I've done something and I feel like I'm doing it well, I'm like, what's next? What else can I try? So, you know, John Boyce is this incredible, uh, does these incredible video essays about American sports, about a lot about baseball, the Seattle Mariners and, and other stories. And people kept saying, you know, you have a similar writing style to him. Have you ever thought about video essays? I had thought about video essays. It's just that I didn't really know what they, how to make it work. In my mind, it was like I would have made documentaries, short documentaries, so 20-minute documentaries on a subject. And then you watch John Boyce and you're just like, wow, that the, you can really let your freak flag fly a little bit with your writing a little bit here. I can make a video essay. I, I won't quite be in his style because it'll be my style. So I'll go off on my own um, a way of doing it. But his basic way of putting them together, um, that is a lot easier than putting together a documentary, which means I can make more of them. And I could also be more creative than you can be sometimes in a documentary. So, so video essays are <coughs> the new thing that you're trying? Yeah, so I did one recently on... Um, uh, the most improved player on uh, Test cricket. I've got another one coming up shortly. Um, I've got about two or three others that I've uh, I've been writing as well. So you know, it's it's not about me trying to break new ground. It's just like, how do I do this new thing? How do I explore it? Um, for instance, I probably did my first podcast in two thousand and eight. I was so far ahead of everyone else doing podcasts. Um, I had my own YouTube channel in 2008, 2009, um, but I'm still finding new ways to do those. Like there aren't that many produced narrated podcasts in cricket and yet those are quite popular outside of cricket so I was like 
well, I can do that for the history of cricket. I can do something like that. So I've gone and uh, I've gone and done that. It's not so much trying to um, be a pioneer in all these things. It's just like, uh, how does my brain work? What's the next idea? And then I and then I follow it. And for every success, there's like eight failures that people forget about. And that's true. That's true. That's definitely true. So, you know, you, there has been a major basketball influence and there has been a major, like you, you are big on basketball, right? So do you think that has had an impact on the way you see the game? Because both the games are very different. And especially when you, you know, grow up watching NBA, uh, the way it is packaged and the way, say, something like test cricket is packaged, they are entirely different entities, right? So do you think that had an impact on the way you perceive things as far as Uh. cricket is concerned? I mean, I grew up in a multi-sport family. Um, I was um, uh, tennis, tennis, badminton, um, uh, table tennis were probably my best sports, squash as well. Uh, so I was a tennis coach when I was 18, 19, started training. I had a couple of um, kids that I was uh, coaching at that point. Um, I played basketball from probably the age of about 12, 13, a lot of street basketball, but also organized basketball. My dad's a golfer, so I played golf. Um, I played Aussie rules football. Uh, and then, you know, Melbourne is just a thing, you know, just a place where you try all these different sports. So m- perhaps all of those different things seeped in. But I, I think, f- I-, I think when you look at the differences with me, it is literally that most sports writers up until very recently sort of came through that newspaper style or, or it was either newspaper or um, sports book style. Yep. And I think for me, because I learned to write in a completely different way, I basically ta- taught myself how to write from uh, watching movies, watching behind the scenes movies, reading scripts. Um, and so that that probably has a bigger impact in, in, in all those sorts of things. And just like, why can I not try something else here? Why can I not be, um, there must be another way to, you know, to do this information, whether it's an infographic or whether it's a podcast or whatever that is. So I think it comes from that sort of thing. But I'm a very weird mix of a lot of different things. So my mum ran a theatre company. Uh, so I was on stage at a very young age um, and acting. Uh, I, you know, I uh, we went into a filmmaking background. So I, the only thing I've ever really trained in is how to make films. So I've got that. My father was a cricket coach. Um, I, I became a cricket coach. I've coached in basketball, cricket and um, tennis at times. Um, although tennis was the only one I really took seriously. So there's a lot of different things that sort of all come together. And I think that that all then matches with the internet and the explosion of the internet. Um, and suddenly you have the, the, these access uh, to other things. But I think most people are fundamentally, uh, they try and copy what someone else does. And I suppose what, what I do is I try and, I, 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 it's not that I don't, don't try and copy what other people do, but I try this and then I try that and then I try this and then I try and mash them all together. Um, and sometimes I just accidentally invent things. Uh, so if you look at two pricks at the ashes, which became the two chucks on, on Crick Info, yeah. um, that's basically, and I always tell this story, I mean, p- people don't use their skills. If you look at b- the basic skills that, that we had is me and Sam were both cricket writers. Yeah. Uh, Sam is a natural producer. Sam used to go around the world on cricket tours and get like Devin Malcolm to take a photo with a stuffed teddy. <laughs> um, and if you can get Devin Malcolm or NASA Hussein to take a photo with a stuffed teddy, there's a fair chance you're going to be able to get NASA Hussein to do the intro to our show when we're doing the show. You might, yeah. And you'll be able to get the English journalist. And then I was a filmmaker and an editor um, and I had this fairly distinctive voice. And it's like, well, if we mix up all the skills that the, the both of us have, we can sort of come up with this online show. And, you know, um, it was probably outside of, you know, uh, people like Roe Belinda and the Cricket Clip people. It's probably mm-hmm. one of the first real successful things that uh, Cricket had ever had on YouTube was these two guys who were like the 35th and 45th most famous people in the press box uh, making a video series. Um, you know, you use your skills and you go in those ways. And uh, one of the most frustrating things for me is you, you see these really talented writers and they and they never go out of their lane. Mm-hmm. It's like, that, this is it. I am a writer and I do this. And it's just like, there's so much great ways you can use writing talent. Um, and there's so many ways that you can push these different things. And most of the people, especially if, if you look at the Crick Info crew, so many of that Crick Info crew come from these random backgrounds. Um, you know, like Fernando, you know, almost became a lawyer. 
uh, for instance, and you know ha- had the choice between going through. We so many engineers seem to come through Crick Info. Um, George Joe Bell was a radio DJ. Wow, um, and, a mu- and a musician. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, someone like Adam Collins worked in politics. Uh, Jeff Lemon was a poet. Dan Norcross, uh, you know, um, ran IT um, uh, companies and, and organizations, and so. You basically, if you use all the different skills that you have in your life from little ones, like I said, Sam Collins, just being able to go up and get players to do silly things all the way through to um, really um, in depth uh, sort of skills that you may have, uh, you know, you may be a draftsman or, or uh, um, you know, uh, you may understand uh, complex uh, math- mathematical things through maybe some sort of training that you have. Once you sort of bring all those things together, um, you start to see it and you also if you look at someone like Harsha Bogle, like he worked for an advertising agency, kind of look at how slick he is with his brand, the Harsha brand. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, you, you bring all those different things together. And that's the thing that I find frustrating with people coming through is they don't really take all of those things and put them together. Um, and I'm just very good at that. I'm a, I'm a, you know, a very much a mix mash um, of many different things. Like I was a really gifted math student when I was about eight or nine. Um, and then by 16, 17, I never went to, you know, I never even turned up to math class. But because I had that math thing, when I threw myself back into analytics, I'm not going to be as good as someone who's actually, you know, got a proper analytical background or a proper math background. But I do actually understand math to a, to a decent um, a level. And I can train myself back up because I have that available to me. I just find that there are many different people out there that have those sorts of skills. So just don't use them um, uh, and, and don't get the most out of themselves. So I, I try and encourage other people to do all those sorts of things because they've worked for me. Well, you know, reading you has been an experience which always puts a smile on my face. Now I can say the same as far as listening to you is concerned. And uh, one takeaway from, you know, your journey, what you said about your journey is that one has to be an explorer and that exploration might lead him to become a pioneer one day because you definitely, as as people who have been reading about the game for so long, you definitely come across as someone who has broken new ground. So, brilliant. Anyway, we have talked to Gerard Kimber, the cricket writer. Now let's go and meet the Gerard Kimber, the cricket nut who in this episode is going to tell us about the five photos that captivate him from the game that are special to him. So, Gerard, let's do the honours then. Let's begin from photo number five. Yeah, it's a really interesting one, this one. I love that story and well, hopefully uh, I've got a, a history of cricket podcasts now and um, I think it's probably almost a three-episode story, that test, uh, the different people and how cricket came to be. And you got to remember at that point, cricket was really struggling. If, if you look at the run rates in, in um, 1950s cricket, I think they got down to under two runs and over. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cricket had really changed, and, and we had this like little boost after nine after World War Two, where everyone was quite excited, and cricket was quite loose. And then I suppose the whole world got very conservative in in the fifties, and cricket certainly was a was a vanguard of that. I mean, a lot of this sort of gentleman nonsense and looking back at the past uh, that cricket has become, uh, I think it, it is sort of steeped in the nineteen fifties. I think uh, cricket was actually uh, a very innovative. In, in, I can't even say, but it, there was a lot of innovation and a lot of um, different changes within cricket. In the 1950s, we all we sort of stopped, and 1960s sort of seeped into that. And then you have these two magical cricket teams. I mean, some of the players on these two teams, the all-rounders, uh, you know, on on those t- teams, you know, Worrell and Benno and Davidson, uh, you know, Wes Hall, and, um, uh, you know, uh, the kind of bowler he was. It's just a magical team. And then you have a tie. You know, Australia were cruising in that game. That Basically, Australia invented one day batting to a certain extent in that game. And I think Australia had been going towards it for a long time. If you look at, you know, um, and there's a reason that Mancad, um, uh, Vinu Mancad actually started running out Bill Brown. It's because Australians worked out that if you back <laughs> up and you sprint, you'll get more runs, right? They would not Which sounds hilarious to us to now, but run. that's not, yeah. And that wasn't how, that wasn't how England played cricket. That wasn't how other teams had ever played cricket. Um, and even if you look at, you know, the uh, Bradman was a huge part of this. Watch the Bradman's running between the wickets and then watch um, some of the old, old England players running between wickets. Completely different species. Um, and Australia was moving forward. And, and that's what they did. Benno and Davidson basically played this incredible one day innings uh, where Davidson slogged and Benno ran. Um, and it just just brilliant cricket from, from, the, from the two of them. And then they get really close. And then, of course, as, uh, as, as, which makes this brilliant, there's a collapse at the end. There's panic. Both teams are panicking. And then there's this brilliant 
run out to finish it off. And so that one photo has all these incredible stories. Like Klein um, is the uh, um, one of the batsmen there and Klein goes on to like save a test match for Australia at another point, but he was a terrible batsman. And, you know, there's the story about how Davidson went out at the end and all this sort of stuff. But in that one photo, have a look. I mean, I, I, off the top of my head, there must be about 12, 13 people in, a, in what is a, quite a close photo. Yes. It's not like a wide shot. It's, it's right there. Um, and there was a run out, I think, before that as well. Um, there's the magic of it. But also that photo was used on the score books in Victoria and I think throughout Australia. So if you played cricket in, in, in Australia or certainly in Victoria, but I think they were more Australian wide, um, mm -hmm. you know, the company that you bought your cricket, uh, your um, score books from, this is the cover, right? So everyone saw this and everyone learned about it. And every young cricketer I ever met would eventually ask, you know, one of the older guys, what is this? And they get told this story. So it's a very personal thing for me, but it's also a brilliant cricket story. And uh, it, it is one of my, uh, I, th I think it is one of the great moments, you know, have, if we had a test like that now, uh, with all due respect to, you know, Kusil Pereira and Ben Stokes, um, I think that test was just crazy on another level. The only one I can think of that was very similar was when I think India beat Australia eight wickets down and uh, it was Laxman and there was a leg bye and all sorts of things. And that was maybe one tenth <laughs> as yeah. tense as this particular test was. Um, even, even the other tie test with Australia and India, I don't think it had quite the, as tense as it was. I don't think it had quite the drama towards the end. Everything happened at the end of this test match. And I think Wes Hall might have bowled the entire session as well. Just in incredible things. So for me, that photo is, um, uh, it's the best of cricket, really. And, it, and it's maybe, you know, uh, it's just something that always takes me back uh, to, to this uh, incredible time in my life when I was learning the game and also learning about the game. Well, this is, yeah, this is cricket at its absolute best. And, you know, there's a great story behind this photograph that, in one of the earlier episodes, one of our guests, who is an Indian cricket historian, he narrated it, you know, about how there was actually some confusion regarding the score and that it might be possible that when this picture was taken, West Indies thought that they had won the match. And yeah, I think they did. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's all part of it. There is so much spice in the picture. You can see all the elements of excitement there. So one wonderful picture. Moving on, what is next? What, what, which picture would you like to talk about? Yeah, I picked the Jack Iverson photo because it's such a haunting image. Um, I think that in cricket, we, I, I suppose my part of being a cricket historian is um, following the evolution of the game. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that I know all the stories of cricket, but what I've been trying to do really is piece together how everything happened. Uh, how to how the reverse swing came to be uh, 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 reverse swing or reverse sweep um, how batsmen started hitting the balls to different parts of the field all these sorts of things are the sorts of things that I've been putting together in my little part of cricket history and I think the Jack Iverson picture for me uh, is a very good example of there are certain deliveries that you know have gone on to become uh, a staple of, of maybe not a staple but a part of uh, cricket that we don't always we don't always know have the, the greatest photographical evidence of where they started and all these sorts of things. Whereas with Jack Iverson, we have this incredible haunting image. I mean, he almost looks like a, you know, almost looks like a Frankenstein hand holding this ball in this weird way. You know, I remember the first time I saw it as a, as a kid and, you know, tried to practice it. And uh, I just think it's, it's actually a beautiful photo. Um, yes, and not all, you know, and, and you know, not all of, of these photos are, are going to be, um, you know, that I will pick or that other people will pick. But in this case, that is a beautiful photo. And I think it's, uh, it also, you know, it's historic in its own way as well and shows us someone was trying something different at a certain time and was successful at it for, for a short period of time. And, you know, those sorts of balls of, you know, the sort of balls that Iverson have bowled have gone on to be basically carom balls and balls of that, of that nature. So they've come back again, um, slightly different and, and you know a, a slightly different version so we've got this historical document of what someone had done at a certain time um and it's very illustrative as i said it's a very beautiful photo so um it always sticks with me that particular image plus it goes with uh, gideon haig's book which is an incredible uh, story in itself wow i thought you hadn't read it <laughs> so you have read you have read gideon haig books after having met him I basically, when I did the history of cricket, um, I had to go back and read um, books about uh, cricket history. So, uh, you know, and I tried to find the best books about cricket history that I could. And that is obviously one of them. Um, so now I've read 
way too many books on cricket history. But by that point, it couldn't corrupt my writing. My writing was already pre-corrupted. Already, yes. Great. So which would be your favorite Gideon Haig book? Because, uh, yeah, which one did you enjoy reading the most? Well, the most important one for cricket is probably Spear of Influence. Um, because, because it's it the first so closely one. related to the death of gentlemen. Well, because at that point, other than Spear of Influence, um, no one was talking about cricket politics. And that's a hugely important thing. These people make these decisions, good and bad decisions, um, without, any, uh, without any oversight, without anyone talking about it. You know, you know, English cricket journalists, talk, you know, used to used to be proud proud to say we talk about men in uh, men in boots, not men in suits. And I'm like, well, it's the men in suits who make all the decisions about the men in boots. And just so that you guys know this, um, it's a ridiculous way. And I think sphere of influence maybe. Um, I think I was already interested in it, but I think it radicalised quite a few other people who ended up getting involved in uh, looking at cricket governance and politics. And I think that's a really important thing. It's probably not his best book, but uh, it may be his most important. Well, that's it for today. There are still photos, three of them, in fact, that uh, Gerard is going to be talking about, as well as a lot more, including uh, the one that got away section. It's a fairly long discussion. But for that, you will have to wait a bit as all of it comes out in the next few days in our next episode. Till then, let us know in the comment section how do you feel about the return of cricket in times of COVID-19. While you wait for the next episode, just join the discussion on our social media handles. We are there on Instagram, Facebook as well as Twitter. Let us know what do you think about the recent happenings in the game of cricket and we'll be back soon with the rest of the episode.